As for news that I would have thought was complete conspiracy when I was an environmental reporter, let's take a look at what's happening. Cloud seeding is back in the news. Anomaly tweeted, they're spraying the skies and most people have no idea. And then has a screenshot of an ABC7 story that I'm going to show you in a second and writes a quote from them. The silver iodide are released as particles into the atmosphere by 15 ground-based seeding generators located near the base of mountains surrounding the Santa Ana River watershed basin. And the headline, SoCal water officials test cloud seeding in effort to increase region's water supply. The four-year pilot program launched in November with an aim to increase precipitation by 5% to 15%. Many of you probably know that I was an environmental reporter for a few years in the Seattle area. I covered environmental issues like drought and flooding in Seattle. And if you had told me at the time, I started covering the environment in 2015 and finished covering the environment in 2019, I, if you, I would have thought you were nuts if you had told me that they were spraying chemicals into the clouds to increase precipitation. I had literally no idea that was happening. And obviously now it's, it's just in the news on a regular basis, which begs the question, why all of a sudden are we talking about it? Because not to say it hasn't been in the news. I, I found a Texas story from several years ago that was talking about it. So it has been a mainstream news topic. And by the way, I am in my friend's kitchen again in Washington State. If you're wondering what happened to my background and my technology, that's what's going on. But it has been in the news. It just seems to be in the news more. I'm seeing it more and more. And maybe that's just because these pilot programs are springing up because this was launched last November. It's a four-year pilot program. And maybe this is just becoming something that is being reported on because there are more, there are more projects now underway. So let's uh, take a quick look at this video. This comes from, again, ABC7 in Southern California. And we're going to go through it and talk about how what I think from a former environmental journalism perspective is so interesting is really just the lack of critical thought about these projects, about the potential dangers. And I'm going to show you a story about India doing this. And actually, the report I thought was rather fair. They brought up some important points to push back on not just known risks, but all the things we don't know about problems related to cloud seeding. And if you're not familiar with cloud seeding, they're spraying silver iodide into clouds when a storm comes through, trying to increase the volume, essentially, and the power of the storm to get more precipitation. Obviously, like one great question is, what if this gets out of control? What if it makes the storm so bad that it affects human life in another negative way, you know, from what they're trying to solve, their problem they're trying to solve, which is drought? What if it creates really bad storms? Great question. Where is that in this report? Okay, let's watch it. Let me know if you can't hear. And the Inland Empire want to make it rain. And they're using science in the process called cloud seeding to increase the amount of rain in some areas and help boost regional water supplies. How about as Israel Leticia Waters explains. Water is a precious resource and one completely dependent on the climate, which can vary from year to year. So water officials are turning their sights to cloud seeding as a way to squeeze more water out of passing storms. The idea is to use particles, in this case silver iodide, and have them generate or enhance more precipitation in clouds so it falls as snow and ends up augmenting our water supplies. Josh Mosier is the general manager of the Santa Ana Watershed Project Authority, which includes five water districts in both the Inland Empire and Orange County. He says the project aims to increase precipitation by five to 15%. The four-year pilot program involves using 15 ground-based seeding generators located near the base of mountains. Those are the headwaters, if you will, for our water supply. So it falls as snow, it eventually melts, and comes down existing rivers such as the Santa Ana River, which runs through our watershed, and then that's where we capture it. Mosier says if cloud seeding just produced 8% more precipitation, it would provide enough water to serve 16,000 households for a year. Mike Gardner, who serves on the board okay, of Western so, so Municipal far, Water I mean, District, we're halfway says through the story. local water agency. We're halfway through the story, and so far I haven't heard about any of the risks. It's all been government officials talking about this project and 
their definition of the problem and their definition of the solution. Um, we've got like less than a minute to go on the report. Would be able to rely less on imported water. Western gets the majority of the water that, that we serve from the state water project. So it's imported and it's more expensive and a little less reliable. And we're trying to get more and more local water. We're up to about 40% local water. But seeding can only occur when a storm is approaching and when certain criteria is met. So we have suspension criteria in place. So there are certain storms that are so large, we would not cloud seed. Once the pilot okay. program is wait, over, wait, water agencies wait. will use the Hang data on. collected go back. to make a decision. Did you hear they that? So he said, basically, I don't know why the screen's blinking like this. It's like going to give me a seizure in a second. But anyway, I hope you guys are okay with it. He basically just said, and they kind of glossed over the fact that he's like, yeah, there's some storms that are so big, we wouldn't do it. But it's like, why? Why wouldn't you do it? Oh, because it could cause massively destructive storms. And then like, what about the future storms? Because they make those worse, even if you're not cloud seeding. And then what about silver iodine coming down on us? What if, what, how does that affect like what's raining down on us in, in the water and the environment and all these other things? But anyway, he did mention really quickly, but they didn't dig into it. The risk of what if they, what if they underestimate the storm, they add this stuff to the clouds and then they cause a massively destructive situation. Okay. Let's see if this will even work still. I don't even know if it will come on. It's freaking out on me. Let's go back. Well, you know what? This is a good opportunity for me to just tell you how to support my work. And I'll go back to getting that thing to work again. Uh, don't forget, allisonmorrow.locals.com is one of the best places to go be on the editorial board. Um, but if you're a wine drinker, you all know about allisonwinepromo.com. You can't beat it, right? Uh, allisonwinepromo.com. And you get to get 50% off of my favorite wines and 50% off of shipping. And I'm going to bring up the screen because if you've never had a high extremist all student Malbec, you're really missing out. You want to be an extremist, but you don't want to go to federal prison. You don't want to have the FBI come after you. So far, I haven't heard of them doing that at AllisonWinePromo.com. Uh, these are my favorite wines. They come from extremely remote regions of Argentina and from small family operations, handpicked grapes, vineyards that are over 200 years old, places that you would you could potentially die trying to get to. In fact, Will Bonner, the guy who owns the company, he said he did almost die uh, on his way to visit one of these vineyards. They're very, very remote. You cannot get them at the grocery store. Why would you want to? AllisonWinePromo.com. Thanks for already having a sip in honor of uh, free speech and against censorship. And bring this over to whoever you have unfriended over the last couple of years because of the crazy stuff you've seen on the news and have a glass of wine and just you can either agree to disagree, which is one of my least favorite phrases, or you know what, maybe you can just have a glass of wine and talk it over. And maybe you'll, maybe you'll realize that uh, you were divided and conquered by the special interests, and you may have more in common than you think. AllisonWinePromo.com. Okay, I'm trying to pull up this article so that it actually works without freaking everybody's nerves out. It's going to make these anchors talk again. So hang on, give me a second. We're going to go back to watching this video and talk about um, cloud seeding. So let's see here, let me just bring this back over. And it's just funny because I would never have thought about this when I was in the news business. <laughs> this was just not on my radar. Okay, let's bring it up here and see what's going on. Um, okay, let me pull up the volume. Let me know if you can't hear it. Okay, here we go. Let me pull this back. Ones that are so large, we would not cloud seed. That's Once what he says about so large, over, we would not cloud water seed. Water agencies will use the data collected to make a decision. They want to know what the benefits are, make sure this is cost effective, and that they would make a decision whether we would continue this program in the future. Uh, okay, not risks. Future that is looking thirstier for more water. Okay, so they're not going to look at the risks, he says. They're going to just look at the benefits. <laughs> I mean... I'm assuming they're actually looking at risks. It's a big weekend a this morning, last minute. Notice. He doesn't say we're looking at the risks. They didn't really talk at the ri of the risks at all. He just talks about the benefits and cost. So, okay, first, number one, we what that tells me is they don't know if cloud seeding even works. We've been doing it for a long time, and apparently we don't still know if it works. Secondly, they're trying to look at how much money we're spending on these programs. We don't know if it works. We're spending a ton of money on it. And they don't know. And when it comes to risks, we're not even talking about the risks. So screw that. We're just, we're just going to pretend like that doesn't even exist. Um, I found this article about India, which I thought was really actually a, a decently reported 
article about this issue. Um, I can't speak for the publication because it's not on my radar on a regular basis. I don't cover India that often, but I did see this and I thought, uh, you know, they go through benefits, disadvantages, cost, what you need to know, all you need to know. Um, and, you know, I really actually thought this guy, if this is a guy, did a good job. The Delhi government is considering the use of artificial rain through cloud seeding to combat air pollution in the city. So it's different. So that's why they want to do it there, combat air pollution. Here's a look at benefits, disadvantages, and the cost of cloud seeding. But he does talk about silver iodide, though he calls it iodine in this article. But anyway, um, he goes down here. Uh, okay, talks about what is cloud seeding, discusses it, benefits of artificial rains, and at least goes into disadvantages. Um, it says they need suitable meteorological conditions. So you got to have, you got to have something in the sky saying that, that you got to have like specific conditions. Um, they're not a guaranteed solution for their problem, which they're talking about pollution. It differs from project to project. And here's what, this is my favorite part. Use of potentially harmful chemicals can affect plants. And talking about a paper written about this says there's no substantial study done on the implications of silver. He says iodine, but it's iodide on the environment. However, silver iodide, well, maybe they're, they're, uh, maybe they're, what do you, mutually, not mutually exclusive. Maybe I don't know enough about silver iodide and there is a silver iodine out there. So I'll just leave that out there. But iodine, iodism, a type of iodine poisoning where the patient exhibits runny nose, headache, skin rash, anemia, and diarrhea, among others, it added. So those are potential effects. Uh, according to several reports, artificial rains might eventually change climatic patterns. If not regulated or controlled properly, cloud seeding may cause undesirable, if not altogether destructive weather conditions, such as flooding, storms, hail risks, etc. Does that sound a lot like what the news talks about now, but blames on climate change? Explaining further, it said the places that naturally receive less rainfall or no rain at all usually do not have the infrastructure to handle so much precipitation. Therefore, with cloud seeding, these areas may become flooded quickly, causing more harm than good. So at least this person talks about it. And the process to generate artificial rains is very expensive. Now, you know, he's talking about here. He goes on to talk about a research uh, study done by this guy at the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers, who ultimately says that he thinks that the problems with cloud seeding are not great enough to override it because he really wants to keep temperatures down and they should just do it to keep temperatures down. So he doesn't think the risk is greater than uh, the risk of not acting. The, ri the risk of acting is less than the risk of not acting. So that's his ultimate summary according to this article, but that's a subjective reality, right? Whether you say that, cause how can you even say the risks? You don't even really know the risks long-term, honestly. Um, it's just like the whole safe and effective line we heard over and over over the last few years, even though the experiment was happening at the time, you know, the experiment with the vaccine, the COVID vaccine was happening and is still happening right now. And yet we were told it's safe and effective. And then people like me were ripped off of YouTube for questioning it and then also fired from our jobs for that. And because it, it was safe and effective, but how do we know it's safe and effective? We haven't even, we haven't done it long enough to know. So, you know, when you're in the middle of the experiment, but then you're not allowed to talk about it, one of the things that I just thought is so interesting is just the fact that this is in the news a lot more. Um, anyway, I, you know, I just think like I'll go over to locals real fast. Cause this is a good question. And I was just thinking back on agent orange Brisbane is cloud seeding different now from when it was done many decades ago. I seem to remember the concerns being discussed then. I don't know um, how it's changed over time. I think that would be a good interview to do. I will say this, it takes decades for, the technology we use like DDT or agent orange to be identified as problematic. we end up using it for years and years and then finally say, Oh, well that causes cancer. Whoops. I guess we shouldn't have done that. But at the time we, we just, you know, do it liberally and, and uh, tell everybody to just be quiet. You're a conspiracy theorist if you question it. So, yeah, I mean, it, I think silver iodide has been used for a while. Um, I know one thing that's changing is that they're using these ground-based remote seeders. That's what the Southern California experiment is working on. Not like the chemtrail silver iodide seeding. They're doing it with these, you know, ground-based 
tanks that just shoot it up into the sky um, instead of a, uh, a plane? Are they doing that because it brings less attention to what's going on? Or maybe it's more cost effective. You don't have to have anybody there operating it. But, you know, then the, there's all, uh, there's obviously the risk of, you know, there's not a person there. So what happens if something goes wrong? And it just sprays it all over the place. I, I don't know, man. I just, I just, I'm not saying like, like I said, in, you know, in the last report I did talking about the North Carolina superintendent, school superintendent race, I'm just taking their own information and asking, did they make the case they're trying to make with their own, their own arguments? And I just, where's where's the critical thinking about like the potential downfall and are you like are you in fact making the case which they are they're trying to promote this as they they promote the problem the government identifies and then they promote the solution the government is identifying and maybe they're saying they're not promoting it they're just doing a report about it and i'll just be the first one to say i probably would have been just like this person like running around thinking you know whatever I'm not going to necessarily give myself any credit back when I was in the news business. It was very easy to overlook a lot of the downfalls of this stuff because number one, you didn't have time. Number two, you were not interacting with people often who had the critical cap on a place like Seattle or Southern California. There's a lot of ideological homogeneity. It's very easy as a reporter to think, you know, everything because you're hearing all these loud voices about the environment that are all aligned. And it's if, if you're not actively trying very, very hard to get outside of that ideological bubble, you will not you will not find it uh, because like in Seattle, even the people who may have a different opinion are often very scared to speak out because they'll lose their grant funding. I ran into that all the time as an environmental reporter, people who just didn't want to who didn't want to cross the narrative because they didn't want to upset somebody in a position who held their grants. It, it, you know, in tow. And so it's, it's just one of those things where, you know, you just, you, you as a reporter, and it, especially if you're general assignment, you don't cover the environment on a regular basis. You're just, you got 90 seconds to tell the story. You had two hours to try to understand what's going on. You think the government is telling the truth. You're working with all of these assumptions and no time to question them. And that's how these reports get put out there. And they're very harmful. I mean, now I see how harmful they are and I see what I participated in. Don't forget that I also have a new sponsor, TeleRx. If you go to TeleRx and use promo code Allison, um, you can get 20% off. This is an online pharmacy that launched to combat medical censorship. Um, I got an EpiPen for allergies to wasp stings recently for half off what my local pharmacy wanted to charge me. Um, because they do direct to consumer pricing. They're different than a lot of the online pharmacies that have like come up during the medical freedom era because they don't do any data mining. You don't have to present any of your own personal medical data. You don't have to have a prescription. There's no long doctor visit. You basically consent to understanding what it's for. I consented to understanding what an EpiPen is used for. And um, that's it. You don't have to put any pictures no medical history. So with a lot of the online pharmacies that are out there right now that are doing direct to consumer stuff and, you know, are trying to get the red tape of bureaucracy down, which is something that we needed over the last few years, specifically with people not even being able to uh, talk to their doctors about stuff because doctors weren't even allowed to discuss any of this, but then pharmacies refusing to fill prescriptions because the medical commissions are putting them under duress, all that stuff. But a lot of them um, are storing data, uh, patients are requiring a lot of information. And in this particular case, you consent to understanding the drug use and that's it. And so it protects patient privacy. And I got my EpiPen within a day or two. And like I said, I got it really cheap compared to what my local pharmacy was going to charge me. I actually left the EpiPen at the local pharmacy because it was not in our budget. And then I got stung two weeks later, and I was grateful to have the EpiPen at home from TeleRx. So TeleRx, promo code Allison, you get 20% off. Um, going back over to locals just to take a couple other questions from people. I'm going to let everybody on Rumble. If you're watching this later on YouTube as well, this is where we're going to end the show for you. If you are over on Rockfin and Locals, you're a supporter, you get everything. So consider going to allisonmorrow.locals.com. It's a great way to support my work. Um, five bucks a month, you get to put in questions ahead of time for interviews. And I will see you all next time.